units. So as an example, Area 1A allocates 100% of the sub-ACL to the months of June through December. Uh, we have border transfers, so that's the amount of herring that can be taken in U.S. waters and transshipped to Canada. We have research set-asides, which can be up to 3% of a sub-ACL. A fixed gear set-aside that's up to 500 metric tons of the Area 1A set-aside for fixed, gears, fixed gear fisheries west of Cutler. And then we have our river herring and shad catch caps. So those are limiting the amount of river herring and shad that are caught in specific regions by specific gear types. So kind of a reminder of our current specification package. This was what was put in place for 2016 through 2018. So our ABC, again, is at 111,000 metric tons. And then after accounting for management uncertainty, the ACL was 104,800 metric tons. For the division of the sub-ACLs, the 2016 to 2018 spec package maintained the same division of the ACL between the management areas as was used in 2013 to 2015. And this was because the ABC was not substantially different and there was no biological need to consider modifying the distribution based on the 2015 stock assessment. The border transfer, the RSA, and the fixed gear set aside were also all maintained at their values. So that it was 4,000 metric tons, 3%, and the 295 metric tons. For the river herring and shad catch caps, they did use a revised method. Um, so specifically that 2016 to 2018 caps used two additional years of data, and they were based on a weighted mean. So in the briefing memo that was sent out as a part of briefing materials, there was a timeline that looked at the specification package for 2019 through 2021. Um, and in that time frame, it showed that the SSC would be meeting in October, and then the council would be taking final action on that spec package in December. And this would mean that the final rule would be implemented sometime in the summer of 2019. So obviously this timeline poses a few challenges, notably that the spec package is going to be or would be implemented after January 1st, 2019. And so this would necessitate the need for an interim rule for the start of 2019. So to address some of these challenges, there is a potential for a new timeline. Um, under this new timeline, there would be 2019 rulemaking, and then the spec package, which would focus on 2020 through 2021. So the 2019 catch values would be implemented via a rulemaking. It would not be subject to the Amendment 8 control rule. And then 2020 through 2021 would go through the specification package. And the potential timeline is up on the screen there. So that October SSC meeting would just focus on the 2019 ABC. That would be, uh, that 2019 rule would be published in January. And then after that time, the council would focus on the 2020 to 2021 specification package and all of those elements. So obviously there's still some questions about the timing and the implementation of herring specs moving forward. However, given the section is not scheduled to meet again until the end of October, and there will probably sev be several decisions that are made between now and then, we wanted to provide an opportunity for the section to discuss the specification package and provide recommendations to the council as they move forward. The recommendations at this point would be for potential analysis or alternatives that the section would like to see considered or developed during that spec process as opposed to preferred alternatives. Uh, so the briefing memo did include some questions which I've uh, put up on a slide here. And these are hopefully intended to prompt discussion by the section this afternoon. Uh, some of those include, does the section recommend the council set aside quota for research? And if yes, does the section recommend that that RSA be maintained at 3% or should a range of options be considered? And I think kind of underlying that question is, does the expected reduction in the 2019 or 2019 through 2021 ACL impact the range of RSAs that be, should be considered? 
Um, after that, we have, does the section recommend the Area 1A quota be set aside for fixed gear? And similarly, if yes, do we recommend it be maintained at that 295 metric tons, or should a range of options be considered? Does the section recommend the council look at various alternatives on how to distribute the ACL between management areas? And then does the section recommend the council consider any other alternatives to the seasonal split of 1A quota besides 100% to June through December? So again, these are just intended to prompt discussion, and we'll leave these up while you guys uh, talk about these. Great. Um, at, at this time, so I can, since uh, as I mentioned earlier, I don't have any of my other state commissioners here, so at this time I'm going to have Bob take over the role as chair to get us through this item uh, so I can advocate on a couple of these, possibly advocate on a couple of these areas. So, Bob. Thank you, Pat. Um, any questions for Megan on Megan's questions? No, and Tony. Tony first, and then I'll go to Richie. And just to help us get along um, with the time and keep us focused, uh, with the time frame, as Megan said, um, what we need to, or what the section might want to consider today is making recommendations to the council for 2019 only, and not necessarily the, the numbers or pounds of uh, quota, but just uh, in these questions, uh, recommendations on RSA, fixed gear set aside, and the rationale for that recommendation. Um, and we could ask Mike if there were any of these questions that they would not be considered changing in an in-season adjustment. I'm not sure that um, changing the percentage for each of the areas would be something that they could do in an in-season adjustment. Um, but we will have time to make recommendations for 2020 and 2021 later in the process, either at our October meeting or even potentially February. I'd have to look at the time frame. But so it would only be 2019 that we need to focus on today. Great. Thanks, Tony. Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Megan, do we know how much revenue the RSA uh, generates? I don't know off the top of my head. I look to see if anyone else does, but I don't know. In Massachusetts? Okay, my thinking is, depending on the amount, um, that um, it might make sense to uh, not continue with an RSA, at least for next year, and if the funds are not substantial, I mean, 3,000 tons, I can't imagine that that generates a ton of money, that we could offset that with some of the excess money that was discussed this morning that we have available. Doug, did you have your hand up, or is that to answer Richie's question? Doug. Yeah, I, I would uh, suggest to the council um, that we consider a range of RSA options, you know, from zero to three percent. Um, I also wanted to f uh, uh, suggest that uh, we consider a range of fixed gear set aside that may um, anywhere from zero to what it is con uh, um, right now, and one could be a proportional reduction uh, in the fixed gear set aside. The other thing I wanted to ask. Is, is either now or for 2019 or for 20 and 21, <clears throat> should we make any recommendations on uh, options for the border transfer? Um, this year, for the first time, we recommend that the border transfer not take place when consulted by uh, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service. So is that another thing that we should put up there on a list for consideration for 2019? Uh, as well as into the future, 20 and 21. That's a good point, Doug. We'll put that sort of in a parking lot and get back to that, that border transfer issue. Um, other questions? Yes, David Pierce. Well, not, not questions. I was going to follow up on what Doug just said. Um, I do support um, having a range of options for the RSA uh, for a number of reasons, one being that if we do away with the RSA, that has a rather significant impact on our ability to sample the catch dioxide 
and to do all the work that's so important for us to monitor what's happening with the fish responding condition and all of that, uh, the move along strategy. So um, with a range of options, we'll, that will likely result then in uh, a better re evaluation of the consequences of reducing the RSA, which some people might want in light of the dramatic drop in the quotas that we're expecting to have. So everyone needs to know the consequence of that dropping it to 2% or 1% or 0%. What does that mean for monitoring of this fishery since uh, the RSA is important for that, for that reason? And then for the fixed gear west of Cutler, sure, I think it makes sense to do what uh, Doug suggested. Just a range of options because I have no opinion on that at this point in time. But, but still, uh, it, um, it does beg for some evaluation, different numbers, consequences to uh, the state of Maine, all of that. Thanks, David. I've got Eric and then Ray and then and then Pat. And then I think we'll see where we are as far as consensus on some of these points and if we can wrap some of them up and then get to, yeah, get to the stickier ones after that. So, Eric. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairmans. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of the RSA and, and the fishery. I, I, I can't answer Richie's question, but I know that the industry was buying RSA even though they really didn't need it at the time. Um, and that was to help uh, finance dockside monitoring. So that, that was an important component. And that, you know, that was the industry demonstrating that they supported dockside mortar, monitoring, not only in theory, but financially. Um, but I think we need an RSA, and, and it goes back to my conversation uh, this morning about the, the new tool in the toolbox, the acoustical survey. Um, industry platforms are far more capable of doing effective uh, acoustic surveys because of the electronics they have on board. Um, so I could see that being a, a reasonably uh, a ripe fruit to pick out of RSA, but uh, if in fact acoustic survey data is going to be considered, then I think we need to be able to involve the industry because they're the ones that have the capabilities of really doing the job, not not the, the vessels, no, not to short sight the vessels that the government has. So, Thanks, Eric. Ray? Yeah, I'm in uh, both Eric and David's. Uh, oh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, camp on the RSA with one caveat. They caught 3,000 metric ton of mackerel, and in order to afford our dockside sampling and keep it in place, uh, I'm hearing sentiment from the table, we'll maybe reduce RSA to 2 percent or 1 percent, but I think industry should be charged or taxed on the mackerel that was landed. I believe those numbers came from 16 or 17. In the RSA, 3,000 metric ton of mackerel were landed. So in order to keep this uh, dockside sampling moving along and getting the funding for it, I think that should be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Um, Pat. Yeah, I would be, I'd be supportive for a range of options. We, it was, we were originally thinking as far as the, uh, the fixed gear fishery, Wesley Cutler, to, to maintain a level of status quo, but I know that may be um, a little bit of a lift considering the reductions that we're taking. So uh, dealing with a range of options for RSA um, uh, and fixed gear, I think, is appropriate. I, I think D Doug is right. I think we just uh, submitted a letter um, on border transfer refers to zero. Um, I, I think with the scarcity of uh, scarcity of bait issues that we're going to be having, um, I, I would advocate maintaining zero as a border transfer at this time. Um, and, you know, in the RSA, in the RSA piece. I think Ray brings up an interesting comment as far as trying to find a ways to ensure that we're not um, uh, getting uh, mixed catches and associated with the, with the RSA fishery. I'm not sure how to deal with that from a language perspective, but uh, I take your point, Ray. Um, but I would also point out that 3% of the reductions in quota, 3% of nothing isn't very much. So a range of options up to 3% may not get us to where we want to be, but I think David makes a good point. We do get a lot of additional value uh, from a sampling perspective. So um, I, would not, I would not be opposed to maintaining even some low level. And, and Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, <laughs> uh, to, to just a question for David, because I, I think 
it, it, am I mistaken? Is your sampling program in some way related to, is it funded by some relationship to RSA? Dr. Pierce? Yes, it is, yeah. All right, so based on everyone that, that has commented so far, it sounds like the board, sorry, the section is comfortable with um, the RSA set aside from, you know, providing a range or recommending a range to the council from zero to 3%. And for the fixed gear set aside, zero to the current um, set aside level. And then um, I didn't, Based on what Doug said and what Pat said, they're the only ones that commented on the border transfer, but based on the, the letter that we recently sent, does, it, does anyone have any objection to maintaining or having consistency in saying, you know, the, the section does not support any border transfer given the scarcity of bait? Is that, everybody looks, I see a lot of heads nodding, so we'll go with those three points as a recommendation. Um, that moves us down, I think, to the third bullet in question talking about various alternatives for distributing the ACL between management areas. Are there comments or thoughts on that or is that not needed? Tony? I think this is one of the issues that it would be very difficult to make an in-season adjustment to. Um, I would turn to Noah if that is an incorrect response. So just for clarification, uh, this would be if the council, New England Council recommends um, for 2019 that rather than going through the full spec setting process, of council spec setting process, that the council requests the agency um, take an in-season adjustment action to um, effectively revise what would otherwise roll over from 2018. Um, and Tony's correct, the, the more complicated that action becomes, the more difficult it is to justify um, and to implement as an in-season adjustment, which tends to be, uh, you know, reserved for very straightforward um, modifications like we discussed earlier for 2018, where we would simply drop the overall ABC uh, and drop the, uh, the sub-ACLs. Does that answer the question, Tony? Thanks, Mike. Tony? Yes, and I believe the same goes for the last bullet as well. I've got uh, everyone, everyone comfortable with that guidance and not taking or making a recommendation at this time on the last two bullets? All right, seeing everybody's comfortable, Peter Kendall had his hand up. Yeah, and I was just going to follow on what Mike said. I mean, the, the Herring Committee, the, the Executive Committee, the Herring Committee, and the Council has not even discussed maybe splitting out 2019 yet. So um, once we go through that, I would imagine, uh, you know, I can't predict, but, you know, with everything going on with Amendment 8 and, you know, having to take final action on that in September, um, and like Mike just said, trying to get this streamlined, for 2019, um, I, I don't expect the council to to add on a lot to that interim action as well. So the quicker they can get it done, the, the better off we'll all be. Ray? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman or Chairman. Uh, question, I was on that call on the uh, transfer the Canadian vessels, so now we have Matt Sieri sitting at the table. Uh, what age are those fish that we're not allowing that permit on for the Canadian transfer for the four vessels? I mean, what's the length of those fish and what's the age of those fish that go to the canneries? Thank you. They generally prefer smaller fish, um, but they do have the ability to stake, so I would probably guess, <clears throat> given Given my, you know, given my experience back when we had canneries in Maine, those would probably be threes or fours on, on average. Three to four-year-olds. Thank you. Any other thoughts or recommendations that the section wants to convey to the New England Council? Not seeing any. Mr. Chairman, do you want to take over the chair, or do you want me to keep going? Are we... Are we
So, um, okay, so moving right along then and being mindful of, uh, of ending around two o'clock and shortly, shortly thereafter gives us about a half an hour to deal with a couple other issues. Um, one, why don't we deal with the AP issue first, Megan, uh, AP nomination and you handle that and then we'll go uh, revisit the conversations regarding the section to a board. So, Megan. Sure. Uh, so Tony had emailed each of the states about kind of all of their AP members in general, and we got two nominations from Massachusetts uh, to the Herring AP, Beth Cassoni and Jerry O'Neill. So I will look to Massachusetts for a motion. Yeah, I would uh, move that we accept uh, as members of the advisory panel. Well, oh, there it is. Uh, move to approve uh, Beth Cassoni and Jerry O'Neill to the Atlantic Herring Advisory Panel. Do we have a second? Eric Reed. Any questions or comments on the motion on the board? Seeing none, any objections? Seeing none, the motion passes without objection. Thank you very much. Um, m moving along, um, and I'm going to have, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, Bob. Um, the um, Based on the conversations around uh, moving the section to a board, a letter was drafted and sent to the commission, and there's ultimately a meeting between commission leadership and council leadership uh, in, in about all management areas and management boards, BC boards, but uh, in particular to a, the Atlantic Caring section. And Bob, if you could recap that meeting, and then we'll. The bars with New England. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. Um, uh, where do I start? So, you know, a series of letters have gone back and forth between this section, the commission, and New England Council talking about voting seats and membership and, and how the, the different bodies should relate and coordinate and communicate. And, um, you know, the latest, the, one of the most recent letters from us to the council um, offered a non-voting seat on the section and uh, also suggested that a meeting of the council and commission leadership uh, to talk about the issue on how to communicate and collaborate would be would be a productive thing. The council said, well, you know, we'd rather not take it, uh, you know, take advantage of your offer and, and have a non-voting seat at the section, despite Peter being here. Um, and um, they also said, but the meeting sounds like a good idea. Let's go ahead and do that. So. <clears throat> Pat Kelleher, Jim Gilmore, and I met with um, the leadership, Tom Neese, uh, Terry Stockwell, and um, John Quinn from the New England Council. And we, you know, we talked for two or three hours about the communication and collaboration. And, um, you know, th there was an agreement, I think, by all six of us that, that more communication and, and better flow of information helps both bodies out. It, it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's getting complicated. It's, it, and, you know, given the specs, and this was before we even knew, I think, about this quota um, issue that we're going to be faced with, we, we just heard preliminarily it's you know there's some bad news coming our way. So it was a, it was a good conversation. It was productive. I think you know we agreed that we should probably continue to meet the six of us and talk about shared issues. And um, one of the one of the direct outcomes of that was we agreed to bring the idea back uh, <clears throat> back to this section of turning the this section into a management board. Uh, if this section is changed to a management board, it would provide the opportunity for the commission to invite the, uh, invite the council to um, have a voting seat on the, on the board. And it would also allow the federal services to uh, sit at the board and vote should they elect to uh, participate. So the, it, the, there's a little bit of a nuance there. The way that the uh, charter works is if this, is, if this becomes a management board, it's up to NOAA Fisheries whether they're in U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service if they decide to participate or not. It's their decision. As far as the council participating, it's up to this section to invite New England Council to have a voting seat, and they can either accept or decline that invitation. Um, so, you know, Pat, there, we talked about a lot of different things um, at that meeting. I don't know if you want to chime in on any more, but really that's the one deliverable that came back to this section. And, and Again, we all agree more communication will help out these these issues of, you know, um, 
shared management of, of sea herring um, are, are, are tricky and there's a lot of overlap between jurisdictions and, and sort of turf issues at times and, and having the, the voting membership back and forth seemed to be a way to help out with some of those turf issues and, and you know ensure the flow of information back and forth uh, just so both bodies knew what the other ones are doing. Obviously there's a lot of membership that overlaps in particular the state directors and some others but um, you know it, it seemed that change you know it, it's up to the group but one option would be changing this to a board would afford some flexibility as far as membership goes thank you Rob. um i mean we are i think the, the word david used on stock status was in a collapsed situation comparing it back to the 70s um and i think the thing that has definitely resonated with me is especially over the last week um, after the PDT met uh, in, in Gloucester last week was the fact that we are definitely in need of more uh, communication and collaboration amongst the bodies and with the agency. Um, you know, we are we are in a very difficult time and will be for the next three or four years, potentially longer, with, uh, with Atlantic Herring. I think now is the time to really step up and make sure that we're all kind of rowing in the same direction instead of arguing about who should be doing what. Um, the, the last conversation we had about this, I know one of the uh, concerning factors was, was on the days outside. Days out would not be impacted. This it would still be um, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts dealing well with the issues of days out. Um, the, the only thing that this does is change the title uh, and add a couple new uh, voting members to, uh, to, the, uh, to what would then be a board. So this will, and just to remind everybody here, this was on the agenda for the policy board. It was not originally on this agenda because it was supposed to be a policy board discussion, but because of uh, the business that we had here today, I think it is very appropriate for this section to make a recommendation to the policy board. With that, David Pierce. Yeah, I would move this, uh, this section, recommend to the policy board that the sea herring section be converted to a management board with a New England Fishery Management Council member having a vote on the board. Second. Uh, we have a motion. Who's, do we have a second? Doug Grout on the second. Er, Eric Reed, I know you've got some thoughts on this. Yeah, I make a motion to substitute. If you want to put it up, that'd be great. Bob, I'm going to have you do take, this yeah. All right, I, I turned over the keys to our original chairman prematurely. Um, so I'll go ahead and take back over the chairmanship. Um, let's make sure the, the first motion reflects what Dr. Pierce uh, wanted it to be. Is that correct, David? What's up there now? Uh, it's not correct, but it's fine. I, I didn't use the word offer. I just said uh, with the uh, New England Fishery Management Council member having a vote on the board to just say this, that's what it should be. I don't think the New England Council is going to refuse the offer. So I would say it, it's, yeah, with the New England Council, that's, that's fine. That's the way I worded it. All right, so we're all set with that motion. And then I think uh, Mr. Reed was indicating he has a substitute motion. Eric? Somebody has it already. Yeah, Doug, you have a question? I guess I, I look at what you had suggested, what you had indicated was in the charter, and that we can invite them to be, um, they don't have to take it. I mean, it's still ultimately their decision on it. So I almost think inviting them to the council to have a, a voting seat on the board is, is a more appropriate word, but if people are okay with just giving them the seat, they still have to take it. It's still their just final decision after we invite them. Yeah, we can invite them to our party, but they don't have to show up. So, yeah, it, it's their decision to accept or not. Um, you know, the other thing with the first motion, I think it actually should be moved to recommend to the, to the policy board to take this action. Um, but, um, Tony, do you have, is Eric Reed's motion in the works?
Eric, you're ready. Okay, so I move to um, my. I move to substitute to recommend to the policy board to change the hiring section to a board and provide one voting seat to the New England Council. If that should say invite, that's fine. Um, this action is conditional upon no the New England Fisheries Management Council adding an ASMFC seat to their hiring PDT and the hiring committee as well. Is there a second to that motion? Pat, Pat Keller. Uh, Eric, do you want to speak yeah, to your motion to substitute? Yeah, um, you know, there's been a lot of conversation with this. I've had I've had discussions with um, council leadership, New England council leadership, um, about I mean, it's a give and take situation. You know, they they would like to have a voting seat on our herring um, board, and currently they already have a seat on our technical committee. Um, so th this is just a summation of, of some discussions I've had with, with the council uh, just to expedite the, the situation. I don't mean to short, shortcut David, but basically that this puts it, uh, you give and you get, and there you have it. So that, that was the whole rationale behind it. Thank you. Pat, a seconder, do you want to say anything? Um. No, but I mean, I, I don't know what the, the the maker of the original motion made, but uh, what thinks of this. But I was just thinking, if, if acceptable, we may be able to dispense with friendlies instead of going back and forth. I'll get to, to the original motion, folks, here in a second. But uh, Doug Grout has his hand up. So this concept, I, I I'm certainly supportive of, except I I'm a little puzzled by. A seat on the Herring PDT. I have a member of my staff on the PDT. I believe the state of Massachusetts has a member of their staff on the PDT. Do you have a member? Every <laughs> we already have a number of state uh, scientists on the PDT, so I don't see the need to have a seat on their PDT in there. There, there was no restriction on, in fact, they were looking for people uh, to be on their PDT. Uh, so I, that's the only thing that I am a little bit, I don't think we need to really have that in there. And I was wondering if, if Mr. Reed would be willing to remove that particular part of it. I think Pat has a comment, then I'll go to Eric. So I, th I think the way that we were we were looking at it, Doug, was that um, council is represented on the commission PDT, and when Megan, who is the member who, who usually goes to the PDT, is reminded that she's not a member of the PDT and can't vote. So this would allow us to have commission staff also there, potentially as a voting member. Then maybe. If I might follow up, maybe we should refine it to say having uh, an ASMSC staff seat to the PDT, to, to their hearing PDT, because as I said, ASMSC already has. Okay. Um, Eric? Have any comments? Yeah, if you want to change it to ASMFC staff, that's fine with me, but... Um, that it, it is my understanding that the, the, this is something that's acceptable to both the commission and the council. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Doug, no problem. If you want to change it to ASMFC staff, a staffer, one seat, however you want to say it, but it be designated as, as staff, that's fine. Okay, thank you. And uh, Pat Kelleher as a seconder shook his head. Yep, yeah, he's okay with that. Does anyone have any, any problems with that change? Um, I'll go to Tom and then I'll come to you. New Jersey and New York do not, don't have members on the PDT. I mean, I'm just pointing that fact out, Doug. You pointed out the three states, but two, two of the members of the section don't have members on the PDT. So maybe it would be an opportunity for one of those states, if they wanted to have a member on the PDT, to basically do that. Because there's always this conversation going back and forth. Before we vote on the final motion, I'd like to say a little bit more. But I'll wait to that. But I just wanted to comment on that immediately. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Peter Kendall? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I appreciate this motion. I mean, as the Herring Committee Chair, too, I would, you know, uh, be fine with, you know, having, uh, 
you know, someone on the committee meeting, sit on the committee meeting, that's fine. And uh, also somebody on the PDT, whether it be staff or um, or even another state's uh, staff, that's that's fine as well. And then, you know, of course, it still will have to be approved by the uh, executive committee and, and the council at that point, too. But sounds good to me. Yeah, Dennis, I'll get to you. I have one question for Eric. So it is the way it's worded now, ASMSC staff seat to the Herring PDT and Herring Committee, is it the understanding that the Herring Committee seat would also be an ASMSC staff seat, or is that just for the PDT? Does that make sense? Uh, I'll get my weed whacker out <laughs> and get, get through all this. Um, well, I'm assuming it would be smart to have the, have the Herring PDT be a staffer. Um, I, I'm very willing to leave a seat on the Herring Committee open. That perhaps gives an opportunity to New York and New Jersey, should they so choose, uh, given Mr. Fody's comments. Um, I, I mean, I, yeah, okay, fine. That's good. I just want to make sure uh, that the section current section knew what the, the intent of the motion was. Pat, you're okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll need to read this into the, the record when we get, before we vote, because it's been changed a time or two. Dennis, and then I'll go to Tom. Yeah, thank you, Bob. When we change from a section to a board, that automatically includes the services, and have the services prior to this proposed action expressed any interest in becoming members of the Herring section board? Um, according to the charter, you know, if we, if you all decide to go from a section to a board and the policy board agrees, then it's up to NOAA Fisheries and Fish and Wildlife Service to decide if they want to be on here. They're not, they're not obligated to, to sit on the management board for Herring. So um, I don't, Mike Pentney's in the back. I don't think the, the service has indicated a preference one way or another yet on whether they would or would not sit on the, on the management board. Tony's got her hand up, though. Noah has sent us a letter saying they were interested in, in a seat on on the board. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has not. Okay, I stand corrected. So they have indicated that. Tom, and then I'll come back to Eric. The herring section has a, a, a real sentimental value for me because when I first got to the commission in 1990, it was the only place that a governor's appointee or a legislative appointee had a vote. Because we were on a board, the, the sections were made up of a caucus vote. So I, w I used to travel with Bruce Freeman up to New England and, and basically sit on every herring board because at least I get to vote at this board. I don't have to sit in the audience and not even being recognized to ask a question. So it's a sentimental value for me. I also realized it was the states cooperating amongst themselves. Without the um, National Fishery Service, you know, sometimes their strong handness in past years, way back then, basically directing us. It was us deciding how we would function and um, and work, and I, it seemed to work fine for all these years. Um, times have changed, and, and there's a lot more cooperation. I can understand why this move is so, but it's uh, it has a little value to me and a little tug of my heart that w this was the first place I was allowed to vote when I came to the commission. No one's kicking you off, Tom. Good news. Uh, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, a, just a, uh, so, some clarifying info that I just came to me. Um, the New England's, uh, New England's PDT policy doesn't allow a PDT member to be on a committee as well. So it would not be the same person in this mode, just so we're clear on that. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad you thought of that. <laughs> I was told to think of it just so they can hear me, so I didn't. <laughs> All right, any other discussion on the substitute motion? Uh, I guess we go back to, to uh, Mr. Kelleher's point earlier. Is there, you know, are the maker and seconder of the original motion willing to sort of, you know, make that motion go away if, if the board's comfortable with that? So we only have to vote once. It's kind of a, a formality either way. Uh, does anyone have any objection if the original motion is, is withdrawn and removed from the, from the list of motions? No. No one objects to that? All 
All right. Well, so the, the, we're going we're gonna to remove the original motion, and we're going to make the uh, motion by Mr. Reed, seconded by Mr. Kelleher, into the main motion. That's essentially a vote. Um, and then I think is, is the section ready to vote on on that motion from Mr. Reed, and Mr. Kelleher, which I need to read into the record since it's been modified a time or two. Uh, move to sub no. Move to recommend to the policy board to change the hearing section to a board and invite the New England Fishery Management Council to have one voting seat. This action is conditional on. <laughs> I can't catch up. The New England Fishery Management Council adding an ASMFC seat to their herring plan development team and an ASMFC seat to the herring committee with the understanding that that will not be the same person. And that, that I ad lib that last part. Any um, objections to the motion that is on the board right now? Seeing none, it carries unanimously. And we'll bring that forward to the policy board on Thursday morning later this week. Richie, we've got about 10 minutes to, to uh, at least introduce the spawning issue and, and, and start the dialogue there and see where we, how far we can get. So if, you, if you're ready, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Should take a lot less than that. I <clears throat> um, was thinking uh, and, and looking at the uh, Matt's report, and the only thing we can really affect other than quota is to <clears throat> ensure that there's the best spawning process that can take place and <clears throat> my thoughts are that we start uh, an addendum to tighten <clears throat> uh, spawning to the uh, best extent that we can <clears throat> and I think there are tools <clears throat> excuse me in the last addendum um, that we could use so my suggestion is in October that that be a um, agenda item uh, to discuss uh, starting an addendum to tighten our spawning regulations. Um, that would be in, in 1A. Uh, secondly, um, uh, Matt <clears throat> uh, refreshed my memory that in talking about spawning on George's Bank, <clears throat> the technical committee had talked uh, about a $50,000 figure that it might take to uh, implement a program like that. And um, if that, uh, if this board, soon to be board, uh, thinks that that makes sense to, to pursue that, then we might recommend to the executive committee or whoever is going to make decisions on the pot of money that we found out about this morning, uh, that possibly that could be a use of uh, 50 odd thousand dollars. Any comments or questions about or concerns about adding that to the October agenda? Dr. Pierce. Well, I think that's uh, an appropriate uh, course of action. Uh, consideration of steps to deal with spawning protection on George's Bank. Uh, we've talked about that for a long time. You know, my fellow commission member uh, Ray Kane and Sarah Peak have always pushed that for a number of reasons. We haven't gone in that direction, but we should in light of the status of the stock. And now that we have, I assume, Mike Petney or his representative uh, going to be a member of the board, we now have more formal federal representation, and that should uh, promote more discussion about what can be done relative to a spawning closure in those federal waters and the extent to which you no know, fisheries can be on board and can, can, assist, can, can assist with that endeavor. So, yeah, I think it's... It's smart. Doug Grout. Yeah, I would certainly support this, um, the addendum and the, the recommendation of looking back at the paper that Pat, that uh, Matt had put together about that, about how to do it, how much it was, uh, some of the drawbacks. You know, that was probably six years ago, I would guess, somewhere around there. Five. Okay. Okay. So maybe inflation hasn't gone up, but just just to consider that um, that uh, you know the price might be a little bit higher now that we're uh, a few years down the road, but still I think that both of them are are excellent ways to move forward. Thanks, Doug. Ray. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doug, for reminding us of inflation. But speaking with Matt this morning, I believe a lot of this spawning work is being done at the dock side now. Matt, is that the discussion we had this morning? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but um, the state of Maine actually is going to start doing a, a fishery independent spawning survey starting this year, hopefully, if we can get all of our ducks in a row um, for at least the inshore Gulf of Maine. Um, but yeah, that's the, a lot of this, the, a lot of the work that I talked about earlier was, was port side, basically going out and, and taking a look at, at samples uh, from commercial vessels. That might be difficult depending on where these quotas wind up, as you can possibly imagine. Um, but we can certainly, we can certainly think, we can certainly think our way through the problem if you guys put it on the agenda. And after I send Megan this paper. <laughs> Sounds good. Any other comments or thoughts? It sounds like there is the overall agreement to get that onto the agenda for October. All right, we will add that. Anything else to come before the herring section? Seeing none, this is probably the last time anyone ever says this, the herring section stands adjourned. We'll start the MRIP conversation and presentation at uh, on time, right at, at uh, 2.15.